Hello and welcome to episode number two of Slash Tracks Reviews. My name is Alex Vanover, and with me always is the most beautiful man on the right-hand side of the screen with the locks of love growing and flowing, the 80 slasher librarian, Mr. Josh LaRue. Hello. And yes, it is proven I am the most attractive man on this side of the screen. So, One out of one. Yep. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, there's, I see a picture of myself to the left of your head. Okay, never what? mind. No, there's both. No, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute wait a minute um so ladies and gentlemen <laughs> slash oh my god oh, oh, hold on help. <laughs> i was just about ready to introduce me and you almost fell out of your, uh, introduced the damn show and you fell out of your chair all right ladies and gentlemen boys and girls children of all ages degeneration x excuse <laughs> no uh it's episode two of slash track reviews uh, as much as we want to talk about 90s wrestling, uh, we're going to save that for the podcast. Unfortunately, we have the the great and arduous task of <laughs> reviewing Freddy's Revenge, Nightmare on Elm Street, number two, for episode number two of Slash Tracks Reviews. Josh, um, as you can see on my background here behind me is Freddy Krueger himself. And that is the VHS cover that used to scare the living hell out of me as a little kid when I would go to the store and I would see that looking at me. It scared the crap out of me. Yeah, that's one of the best, uh, the best makeups uh, that Freddie had. It's not so much pepperoni pizza or burnt cheese pizza. You know, it's kind of witchy. Mm -hmm. So it freaked me out as a kid, too. And you don't see it a lot in the movie, like, up in your face uh, until really the party scene. You know, it's kind of keep it in the shadows a little bit, and I like that. Yeah, they, they kept him in the shadows. They kept him in the dark. They did a really good job not lighting him too well, but then all of a sudden they're like, boom, fuck all that. Party scene. Here's Freddy at the pool. They sh Why didn't they just have Freddy start flipping hot dogs and shit and, like, putting beer in the cooler at that point? You know, just put it on the glove. <laughs> no, they saved, they saved the glove with weenies for Freddy's nightmares. There's actually scenes where he's, I'm pretty sure he's like, he calls it the blendomatic. He's like one of those little vignettes he does where he's like chopping up hot dogs with his glove. It's ridiculous. Um, so we have like kind of an informal uh, format for the show. Uh, the first thing we're going to do to start this uh, format before Josh slices his own throat or cuts his hair off by accident with that Freddy glove, we're going to do a brief... Uh, like a quick background and we're going to share some facts from the production so okay let's do it all right dude so josh this movie freddy's revenge was released on november 1st 1985 so they missed hall they missed the actual halloween date that year by one day so i guess still technically halloween season i guess maybe they missed the boat a little bit on that what, what are your what's your thoughts bit. on the release date a little bit um but you know elm street is not really like ever been like a Halloween thing for me. Like uh, growing up, anytime we had a Friday the Thirteenth in a month, that was going to be tune in to like the Superstation or whoever's like, you know, showing all the Jason flicks. TBS. Uh, Halloween. Yeah, Halloween was for uh, yeah Super. Uh, yes, TBS. I was thinking WGN for some reason. Uh, or is TBS the Superstation? Did you I? You know what? Right? I think TNT was where in Oregon is where the Nightmare on Elm Street film, or excuse me, the Friday the Thirteenth films were shown. Was TNT Turner Classic and TBS? Uh, I think TBS had horror films, but I don't recall them showing a lot of Nightmare on Elm Street films yeah. or Friday the Thirteenth films. But it's like, always TNT. That was always the time for Jason, and then you know Halloween was for Michael Myers. Freddy Krueger is scary anytime because. He's in your dreams, you know? Bedtime. Michael, That's when he's scary. Michael. Bedtime. Yeah, bedtime. Every bedtime. Michael comes at Halloween. Jason on Friday the 13th. Freddy, any fucking time you close your eyes and fall asleep. So Apparently, uh, Freddy's... <laughs> in 1985, Freddy was coming over for Thanksgiving. That's when he's scary. <laughs> gobble, gobble, bitch. <laughs> um, the box office, so the box office take for this film was $30 million uh, on a $3 million budget. So made quite a, quite a profit. Uh, mm -hmm. The film got uh, mixed reviews at best. Um, I think the, 
I was going to say the Rotten Tomato score. I I wasn't. I didn't actually get to look at the Rotten Tomato score, but I know just from my childhood, uh, being familiar with this movie my entire life. Uh, def- bad reviews to mixed reviews. Recently, it's had a major resurgence because uh, the homosexual. Uh, they've adopted it. The homosexual uh, fans of the film. It's got a lot of homoerotic undertones. Uh, they show it at gay clubs all the time. Jesse dancing in his room. Um, yeah. It's, it's Scream quite Queen. Po- it's yeah. A great documentary. Scream uh, Queen. Mark yes. Patton, who plays Jesse Walsh, the star of this film, uh, created a documentary about his experience on this film and his experiences before and after the film. It's really good, actually. Um, I think it's available on... Um, uh, oh my goodness! Uh, chi- I think I chiller? It on, yeah, I think it's on one of the not Chiller. Um, well, it's on Tubi it Screen now. Box? It's Screen, box? Screen box. Yes, originally it was on Screen Box, and I believe it's probably still on Screen Box. But I think it's even free now on Tubi. Okay. Um, so if you haven't seen, on, I think I watched it on Hulu back in the day, but it's not on there. I don't think right okay. now. Um, well, for people who are super broke, Tubi is available to everybody if as long yeah. as you have a Roku or Fire Stick. Uh, go ahead and check out Screen Queen with our friend Mark Patton. Uh, and it's a really interesting look at the behind the scenes, uh, you know, how the film was made and how he got the part and what happened to his career afterwards. Uh, it was a really bad time for... You couldn't really be an openly gay person in Hollywood back then. They would They would blackball you big time. And everybody was afraid of HIV and AIDS at that time. The 80s was a really wild time uh, to be who you were. Uh, it wasn't really yeah. safe. Yeah. Anthony Perkins married uh, a woman uh, for the whole for the whole reason you just explained um, because it wasn't uh, a popular thing to mm-hmm. be a gay actor and uh, it was like his best friend though so it's awesome you know kind of like uh, the lead singer of Queen uh, that was pretty cool um, but Freddie Mercury Mark, yeah yeah Mark Patton is uh, one of my favorite final characters. Uh, I'd love if we could get him on here sometime to chat about his work on this movie and other things. Uh, so if you happen to check this out, we'd love to talk to you. Mark um, Patton, we've tried. I, I know you yeah. always say that. We've tried. Uh, yeah. We even we even had direct access to him on Twitter. We've had conversations with Mark. He's just not interested, I don't think. <laughs> he's, he's just not he's just <laughs> not interested. Um but if he ever does become interested, Mark, please. Come do getting sidetracked with us. Uh, Josh will even cut his hair and donate it to your ch- to your favorite charity uh, <laughs> if you do the show. I'll cut some of my hair. That's an Alex <laughs> promise, not a Josh <laughs> promise. Um, I'll cut this much. So okay. There you go. That, that, that's enough for an interview right there. All right. All right. Hey, uh, so this film was written by David Chaskin. Or Chaskin? Is that how you say it? Chaskin? Whatever. What, however yeah, you say it. <laughs> David Chaskin is actually uh he's the man who wrote it. I think he was a writer on the like the stu- for the studio or he was working around New Line Cinema like he was kind of like a nobody uh and he was tasked with writing this sequel. And I believe he had to write it uh, like with not a lot of time. Uh Bob Shea, the the big wig at New Line Cinema, like the owner of New Line Cinema was like, "Hey, we need to get a, a film made." We want to get a sequel out as quickly as possible because they were trying to capitalize on the success of the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, David Chaskin was actually in Screen Queen, what we talked about. He was kind of confronted by Mark Patton uh, because uh, Mark was convinced that Jesse, the character he was playing, was written and portrayed as a gay character, even though it wasn't supposed to be. And he kind of and then David kind of like sidestepped that and didn't want to talk about it and like kind of denied it and until recently he finally admitted that yes i did write it with undertones uh Mm. just the way mark thought uh it had been which is really interesting if he did it i mean if he is is he admitting it is he admitting that now because it's like popular to say that or is he did he do it or didn't he not do it i don't know i don't know was he telling the truth before or now exactly he's kind of He's kind of muddled that uh, to the point nobody can really know at this point. Um, But uh, whatever it was, it made this a special movie. Maybe not the best (laughs) uh, slasher movie ever, but definitely a memorable one. I remember more about this movie than I do uh, The Dream Child or The Dream Master, Freddy's Dead, 
New Nightmare. I definitely remember this one more. Uh, even, <laughs> even though we got Bob Shea, uh, I'm sure we're going to be talking about that. Um, yeah, th- th- this movie isn't the worst, <laughs> but it's definitely interesting. And like I said, Mark is probably in my top three favorite final characters. I did enjoy his uh, portrayal of Jesse, and I thought he did the good job with what he had. And uh, he went all in on it, you know. Definitely memorable. Definitely something you're not going to forget. I, we're not even to characters yet, but since you've talked about how you love Mark Patton so much, uh, I'm going <laughs> to take the opposite side. I think Mark is not the star of this film. Whether He is the star on paper, but he's not the scream queen. He's, he doesn't... He doesn't vanquish Freddy in this. The entire movie, he's sweating, sleep depraved, and upset and bitchy. Uh, I would say that Lisa will Lisa uh, Weber, his girlfriend in the film, is probably the star of the film because she's the one who actually takes it to Freddy, vanquishes Freddy, deals with it. She's not afraid of anything. She tries to do research the whole time. Jesse's just going to S and M clubs with his uh, gym teacher. <laughs> he's the night. Yeah, walking into his sister's room. There's little girls jump roping out. In the, he's running around the house with no clothes on. He's out in the rain with just his underwear. Jesse's not bringing a whole lot to the table. I mean, Freddy's kind of... Jesse is Freddy's meat puppet in more ways than one in this film, dude. He's not He's not, He's not. not much of a scream queen, dude. Let's just be honest. I, I, I beg to differ. So what is he doing? History. How does he fight him? He's got one of the best screams, man. I'm telling you, he, he's great. I love Mark. He's one of my favorite finals, and uh, we're just going to have to agree to disagree on that one. I might give this one four finger blades just to fuck with you. I couldn't <laughs> disagree with you more. Uh, like, I think, uh, anyway, hey, so the it's director. Weber. That hey. girl looks like, uh, who does she resemble? Oh, my God, I can't think of it. I should have written this been down. said a thousand times. She looks like a discount Meryl Streep. Yes, Meryl Streep. I, I don't know why I couldn't get that in my head. Yes. Meryl Streep did a great job in this movie. So. All right. Uh, <laughs> film. Film was directed by Jack Shoulder, who was interviewed by Paige uh, of Fred Head's fame, the documentary that just came out. So if you haven't seen it, go check that out on uh, on her YouTube channel with DeAndra Laser uh, on uh, <laughs> Night uh, Elm Street Radio. Uh, I'm not sure if they've put out anything in like at least a year or two, but if you haven't seen some of their videos, there's a lot of really good interviews and stuff and content on Freddie over there at Elm Street Radio. Go check it out. Go check out Fred Heads, the documentary about Nightmare on Elm Street fanhood. They interview Jack Shoulder. Uh, he gets a little creepy with them. Uh, not really on camera, kind of off camera is what Paige kind of said to us. Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah, he kind of made some like weird comments. Uh, but so Jack d- directed the film. Uh, I did my research. Apparently, Jack didn't really want to direct a Nightmare on Elm Street fil- uh, film. He wasn't really a fan of horror. But he, after giving it some thought and some uh, heavy deliberation, he decided this movie could probably put me on the map. So uh, he decided to uh, direct the film. What do you they think? They like to fly on the wall for the stuff that they were talking about, <laughs> the off-camera stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, we, when we get Paige on for getting sidetracked, we're definitely going to ask her some of the details <laughs> about that. Yeah, some of the details. Maybe that'll be some uh, Patreon-exclusive content. Uh, what did Jack Shoulder say to Paige and DeAndre off camera when they were interviewing him? There's some, you know, and if you want to hear an extended version of our thoughts on this movie, just throwing it out there, a little, uh, little self-promotion here, you got to check out uh, Slash Tracks, the episode of Slash Tracks. I think it was episode 25. Yeah, uh, where we watched uh, Freddy's Revenge and riffed the hell out of it. Um, but as far as the director goes, um, I guess he spent a lot of time going, no, more sweat, more sweat. <laughs> I need more parakeet, more now. more melting records, more parakeets flying around. Uh, I need more, more dancing, more Fu Man fingers in the cereal boxes. Uh, put the, oh, 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 make sure to put Cole Sharon on the board. Yeah. Throughout the entire <laughs> film, throughout the entire, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with Jack Shoulder's work really before or after. Uh, I wouldn't really say that I'm a fan per se. Um, he gives a really interesting interview on uh, Never Sleep Again, the documentary that Heather Lane Camp made. That's like seven hours long. So, it's good, no. you know, it, it, he's not he's not Wes Craven. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. No. Moving on. Let's get to the cast. Uh, Mark Patton, the star, 
Jesse Walsh, we already know how Josh feels. We've already kind of t- – I, you know how I feel. I think he's not uh, that great of a screen queen. As a matter of fact, I don't even think he's the lead. Um, there goes our interview, but okay. <laughs> oh, our interview that we didn't have already anyway. Um, Kim Myers, uh, Lisa Weber, the star, in my opinion, the heroine, the screen queen, Lisa Weber. Just kidding. Uh, uh, and then we got Robert Russler, plays Ron Grady. Uh Typical jock, kind of loud mouth. Uh, Jesse's friend throughout the film, which is a really kind of like uh, unique friendship, but like a very popular, handsome jock. And then the new kid, effeminate, kind of nerdy guy driving the deadly dinosaur, the shittiest car in Springwood, probably. <laughs> uh, so they're good friends, I guess, apparently. it's kind of, I When I was in high school, I don't remember hanging out with the most popular guy in high school. Uh, Did this you? whole movie has... No, I mean, I, I kind of had friends in every group. I was kind of like a loner and had friends in each thing, but not like the most popular. They were usually dicks. But uh, no, it's the whole movie's like this, like stuff that doesn't really go together, you know, mm-hmm. like like Jesse just wandering into the gay club or his coach being there, uh, him being friends with the most popular guy in school, um, the opening titles not even being the same font or color or style, you know, it's like... Freddy's Revenge, and then, like, big chrome letters, <laughs> you know. Well, you know why they did that? Because that was the 80s, and they were just like, look at all these fonts and colors we have access to. Let's just use like, them all. It's like a teenage science project they did, you know, with, like, uh, Windows 95 editing equipment or something, like, yeah. used everything. Dude, um, we, we have some Slash Tracks episodes that are edited better than this film. Uh, we, we should we should have done that on this movie for like the for the thumb uh, thumbnail like different font different style for every word on it. I tried hey I tried to find stuff for this thumbnail I made the thumbnail originally for Freddy's Revenge for Slash Tracks and it's you know I'm I'm Jesse and I'm Freddy's you know I'm turning into Freddy. And then you're in the thumbnail too I can't remember what character you are and then Freddy's there whatever but. I tried, to, and then I went back, and I'm like, okay, I got to make another Freddy's Revenge thumbnail. There's not a lot of usable stuff from this film. Uh, the images are not very clear or bright. Um, they're kind of retreads. It was hard, man. So the thumbnail that we have now, I think, is actually simple, but it's it's good. It's you know, Freddy, he's got special work for us. We're gonna have to review this shit film, and uh, he can see both of us in his eyes. How about that? All right, um, I, I like it. Let's uh, talk about so Clue Gallagher plays Jesse's father, Ken Walsh. And if you're familiar with Return of the Living Dead, Clue plays the owner of the the factory in Return of the Living Dead. He's basically like the badass of Return of the Living Dead. Uh, In this film, Clue Gallagher is more of kind of like a stern, um, kind of down-to-earth disciplinary father who's looking for a deal on a house with a very troubled uh, and dark past. Uh, and that ends up biting him in the ass because his son uh, basically becomes possessed. Yeah, becomes possessed and sweaty throughout the rest of the time that he owns this home. Would you buy a house, Josh, uh, that was, like, haunted or had oh, yeah. deaths in it? Yes, like, immediately. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm weird as shit, so... And I like scary minute. stuff, and so does my wife. <laughs> you would rather have a haunted house where, like, stuff happened in it as opposed to having just a normal house? Yeah, I I worked at a crematory for a year uh, when I was younger, and it had an apartment on the like half apartment, half crematory, and I got to live there and work there. Uh, so yeah, I've done some, <laughs> I've been in some scary situations. Um, but Clue, I wanted to point out about him. See if you agree with me. Uh, I think he looks, he has the look, and the the voice of like a televangelical preacher. You know, if he were to like play, a, if he were to play a televangelist, it would be a perfect role for him uh, back then. <laughs> well, I wish he had the televangelist powers. He could have just placed his hands on Jesse and get this demon Freddy Krueger out of my son. <laughs> he put the Fu Man fingers on his hands, place it on Jesse's sweaty ass <laughs> chest, and get the demon, the Springwood Slasher, out of his chest, dude. And calls Sharon and tells her about it when he's done. Well, he was trying to call Sharon because he was trying to become ordained. That back in the '80s, you couldn't do it online. You had to actually go to classes. Sharon is the one who had the the ability to teach you how to become a minister. 
Fucking so that, <laughs> yeah, that was who Sharon was. Um, Marshall Bell, who was Coach uh, Snyder, was the father in Stand By Me. Uh, and he's the, <laughs> he's the one who famously gets whipped to death by Jesse's uh, towels <laughs> in the shower scene. And um, <laughs> uh, I just, you know, Marshall Bell does a really great job of playing an asshole in every film he's ever been in. Uh, what are your thoughts on Marshall Bell as Coach Snyder? Um, he's got good taste in, in clubbing outfits. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how he passed, uh, his background check, the way he treats his, uh, students and stuff. I don't think that would fly these days, you know? The eighties um, was different. There wasn't quite as many background checks. I don't think <laughs> you could get people's addresses at the post office. If you gave them a dollar, you could get like any address you wanted. And I, before anybody says anything, I don't mean because he's gay or went to a gay club. I'm talking about the way he treats his uh, students and his athletes. Um, it's very strange. Uh, there's something else going on there. Uh, yeah. So hit the showers while I, while I sit in the office and nobody else is here. It's just weird. Well, the other thing that I wanted to, since you're talking about it, so he catches Jesse at the S and M bar, and he has the ability to take Jesse to the gym, the high school gym at night and like yeah. unlock the gymnasium and had him run laps. I mean, he's like, don't go to a bar, but then I'm going to drive drunk and take you back to the high school. You know, and I wanted to say, I've said this on the social media and stuff. Anything I say bad about this coach has nothing to do with the sexuality. Like I said, I'm, I'm part of the LGBTQ community. Uh, so definitely not attacking that. Um, the, the coach, there's just something going on there, man. It, uh, I don't think he should be allowed to be left with uh, students, especially driving drunk. Because he looked pretty drunk whenever he grabs Jesse by the shoulder. You can tell he's had a few. Did Jesse um, get to finish his beer that he ordered before he had to go back <laughs> to the high school and do laps? That Bob Shea didn't cart him for? I don't know. Did he Did he even take a sip? Um, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Shea didn't card him for playing the role of a teenager when Mark Patton was actually 30. And Bob Shea <laughs> didn't card him when he was the bartender at the club when he was supposed to be under 21. So Bob Shea, just an all-around shit job of ID Mark Patton in every area of his life. Do you think the director or whatever was irritated at Bob Shea wanting to have a cameo in the movie and that's why he put him in that in that role for the cameo or do you think bob asked for that specifically no jack shoulder okay so i know this because i did the research and i don't know if you teed me up for this but bob wanted to play the role of uh grady's father so oh. the guy who played ferris bueller's father uh who plays grady's dad in this film uh bob shea wanted that role uh but jack shoulder was like okay i'm gonna acquiesce and i'm gonna give i'm gonna you can be the S and M bartender. So <laughs> he relented and gave him a smaller part, but a very pivotal part. I think I remember the bartender more than I do Grady's father. Yeah, I don't remember Grady's father at all. I remember him like beating on the door when Grady's That's it. You know, That's getting killed it. by Jesse. Yeah. Damn it, Grady, open this door, Ron. I am your father. Like that's it. <laughs> open the door before I rip you apart. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of this episode now. We're actually going to dive into the actual review part of this film. Uh, we're going to drive right through the title screen like that bus. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> since you brought that up, why don't we show a clip of that? Okay, let's do it. The title screen. We're going to start out the review with a really brief plot description. So in case you haven't seen this film in the last 38 years, here we go. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Pause this part of the review. All right. Jesse Walsh, teenager, moves in with his family to 1428 Elm Street, which was owned by Nancy Thompson from the previous film. Not Nancy, but her mother, Marge. Okay. The film has been sold to the Walsh family on the cheap because of the events that had happened in the previous film, okay? 
Jesse uh, is having a hard time sleeping. He's uh, having night terrors. He's waking up screaming. He's hotter than hell uh, for some reason. Records are melting in his room. Just all hell is breaking loose for this kid. He's going through emotional and just physical hell after moving into this house. Um, Jesse eventually has Lisa, the the rich girl from school, come over. She finds Nancy's diary in Jesse's closet. And they read her diary entries that I didn't know that Nancy was keeping a diary of uh, because they never show that in the first film. Um, And it basically describes Freddie coming to her in her nightmares. So anyway, all hell kind of uh, breaks loose. Freddie kind of reveals to Jesse that he wants to uh, he has special work for him. And he basically tries to possess Jesse's body and kill people in the real world. So he wants to use Jesse as his, like, avatar to kill people in the real world, which makes no fucking sense at all. Um, Doesn't follow the plot at all from the first film because Freddy is a tortured ghost who's trying to kill the children of the people who killed him. Uh, but in this one, does, he doesn't care about that anymore, and he just wants to kill everybody with Jesse's body. Um, mm-hmm. His girlfriend, Lisa, tries to help Jesse get through this tough time. <laughs> um, and the, the movie is basically them trying to get Jesse back to normal and to vanquish Freddy. What are your thoughts, Josh? You got the body, and I've got the brain. I do love that uh, line. That's one of my favorite Freddy lines is in this movie. <clears throat> one of the best ever. Ass. One of the best yeah. lines in the in in the history of the franchise. Definitely. Yes. What's your thoughts? Sure. What's your thoughts on the plot? plot? And what is your thoughts on the direction that they decided to go with this film? Uh, because at the time, it's been talked about over and over and over again by people greater than us that there was like no hundred percent certified concrete nightmare in elm street you know like yeah it it was what it was like there i mean there was no even though the first film was freddy comes into the kids dreams he's trying to kill the kids of elm street they decided to completely take a left turn and do something different there was no established this is what freddy is yet what is your what are your thoughts on the plot and what they decided to do the plot, the whole possession thing, uh, I kind of had fun reading the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror books that do something similar to that. I read those here on the channel, so I'm not going to attack that plot too much because it can work in the right situations. However, it was really weird and polarizing coming out of the first movie into that. Uh, but yeah, if you if you look at it after watching the whole series, it's a lot worse than if you look at it after just watching the first movie. We're kind of jaded now towards that movie because we've seen what comes after you know and what came before and it stands out but at the time i wish i was old enough at the time to have seen it and give you what my opinion was at the time uh but trying to look at it that way i can see that they were just trying to go with something fresh maybe a little scarier freddy's taking over somebody uh i still don't understand who freddy's getting revenge on i wish the plot would have explained that the director Um, or the writer The audience. He's getting he's but, getting revenge on the audience for paying their money to go see this. <laughs> Got you <and>, all, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Got your paycheck. Um, <laughs> go get yeah, your two beats, bitch. <laughs> the the plot, in my opinion, isn't that bad if you look at it as just part two. But when you look at it as as the whole with the whole series. It stands out and sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, I'm okay with it. It's a fun movie for what it is, but it's uh, it's got some memorable moments in it that you don't forget. But then a lot of it is forgettable. You know, I don't know. I don't. It's it's kind of like the fonts in the title. You know, it's just two different yeah. things. <laughs> I think I think what you said was a, a really great point about knowing what comes after it and what came before it. Because hindsight is always twenty twenty. It might even be twenty ten. Uh, it's like, and you want to, you want to. A lot of fans of of the Elm Street films want to rewrite history and they want to change this film. And it is what it is. It has some really great things about it, and it has some really terrible things about it. But the fact that Dream Warriors came out in eighty seven, a couple years after this, and was such a hit, 
and was more of a direct sequel yeah. to the original film really, really put the kibosh on anything that this film tried to do. Dream yeah. Warriors ruined this film. Yes. <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. And I was just going to say the one thing this movie really lacks, it really stands out that it's missing, is the Freddy dream sequences. You know, it, it just, that is what this movie needs. If it had a, a little bit of that in it, I think it could have been salvageable. Like if Jesse was having the nightmares first, running from Freddy, like Tina in the first movie, you know, shit like that. And then after like the third or fourth nightmare, that's when Freddy possesses him and we saw it happen or something. Maybe it would be better, you know, but or, we got or even time. or even Freddy, like you see Jesse encountering Freddy in the nightmares and then he kind of like reveals his plan but not so like, not so like, hey, this is this not you've got the body, I've got the brain. Kind of like yeah. more subtly reveals it, so it's kind of veiled, and you don't quite understand what Freddy's doing. Um, but yeah, his dreams that he has, the way it's filmed, unless you're just you know for a fact, it, sometimes it doesn't even feel like Jesse's dreaming. No. It just feels like he's like daydreaming and seeing the shit for real. Like the girls jump roping or Freddy in the in the basement. The basement. It doesn't, there's no there's no clear thing like in the first movie. You knew when they were dreaming in the first movie because like dream rolls would happen. You know, like uh, the guy talking in class, his voice got lower and lower. She saw the you know, the body bag move or the step thing you hate from the first movie. Shit like Open that. Stairs. Yeah, it just it, it, you couldn't really tell when he was dreaming or awake, and if it had had more nightmare sequences that were obviously Freddy nightmares with the boiler room and shit like that, I, I think it would I'd have a more positive take on the movie, even with the possession angle and Freddy in the real world angle. So that, that's I'm, my thoughts on the. Place. I'm glad you brought that up because um, the scene where Freddy's downstairs, uh, like Mark, you know, J Mark Patton, Jesse is outside and he's looking in the basement and he sees Freddy kind of fucking around with the furnace and he's like putting yeah. a dollar well, he's doing something in the furnace <laughs> um that scene terrifies me by the way that's one of the scariest scenes ever because just the thought of looking downstairs and like actively seeing this fucking maniac <laughs> down in down in your house messing around that's what are you not... doing in there <laughs> yeah, exactly hey, shut up bitch I'm burning dolls down here Jesse I'll be with you in a second you little bitch it's uh, cold in here, bitch. I'm trying to stoke the fire, bitch. Uh, you got any more Fu Man fingers that I can put in this furnace? You bitch? <laughs> and when you're done, call Sharon. Yeah, give Sharon a call. Your dad's bitch. trying to become ordained, bitch. I'm going to kill your bird. <laughs> um, no, you're right. That scene in particular, how you brought that up, uh, I can't tell if that's a dream or if Freddy's actually down there. Thank you. That's there's, my issue up there. That's great. I never even thought about that. It's like there's no differentiation between a dream right in that moment and reality. That could Freddy Freddy's just down there chilling. He's not even in the dream world at this point. He's he's there in the house. Even even the jump rope girls, they don't make it clear because the scene just cuts to the next day. You know, I, it doesn't cut to him like setting up in bed or whatever. So Well, wasn't it his sister jump roping? Yeah, but I mean the bed's gone and everything. Yeah. So it's like maybe maybe she he's like uh, uh not daydreaming but like uh kind of in and out of sleep, you know, like Maybe he's ma like uh like a day like Alice, like he's having micro sleep. Yeah, micro sleep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um so the first thing of the of <laughs> we've gone off topic a lot and I love it. I love where this is went. Um <laughs> So we're going to get into the actual sec the sections of the review. So the very first topic we're going to talk about of this review is going to be Freddy himself. Um, okay. This film, uh, when they made Freddy's Revenge, uh, when they started making it in 1985, uh, pre-production, they weren't going to pay Robert England to do the film uh, because he Robert England wanted a pay bump. And New Line Cinema was like, no, we, we don't need you. We're just going to put some nobody in some rubber makeup and we're going to have him be Freddy. Anybody could be Freddy. They basically thought it was like a Jason or a Michael Myers deal. And the scene, the only scene that's left in this film with somebody portraying Freddy that isn't Robert England is the shower scene uh, where uh, Coach Snyder is killed 
by the, you know, the balls popping and getting whipped on the ass by jump ropes and towels and stuff. Um, if you have a keen eye, you can see in the background, Freddy's kind of shuffling towards, you know, towards the camera. That's not Robert England. That is, that could have been me or you or our parents playing Freddy. It could have been anybody. Uh, that's not Robert England. When they were filming the movie, they realized they made a huge, huge mistake. And they're like, no, we got to get Robert England. We have to pay him. Because he, they didn't realize that he was the franchise. They had no idea what they were doing. And in that instant, they corrected it. And thank God they did. Because, uh, Josh, can you imagine this movie, even with Robert England in some of the best makeup ever, not being in this film? I mean, think of how bad this film is with Robert England in some yeah. of the best makeup ever. Think of it without Robert England now. I don't have to because we uh, <laughs> recently uh, watched it without Robert England, and it's called A Not Run Elm Street 2010. Oh, my God. It, it's bad. It's bad. So, yeah, Man. Robert Robert is this. I wish I could have seen that, too, then, like, filming and being like, oh, fuck, we got to get Robert. You know, I would love to see that. <laughs> so I didn't I, know that story. That's cool. Yeah, I would have loved to hear this. Uh, the discussions in the New Line office. They're like, hey, Bob, uh, I know you're really, really into this S&M bartender gig here, and you made a lot of money in the first film, but you're making a big fucking mistake by not paying this Robert guy because uh, this other guy we got can't talk, shuffles like Boris Karloff, like this fucking Frankenstein over here, uh, can't move his body. Guy? What's that? Who was the other guy? I don't know. I We, I, we would have to look it up in production notes. Uh, we probably Google it later. I have no idea. Just a nobody, just an extra. It, he was—I yeah. don't even know that it was an established actor. It was Kane Hodder at the time. Yeah, it was Kane. <laughs> Kane hey, Slashaholics. Since Josh brought that up, Kane Hodder does have a credit on screen in a movie as Freddy. He is—he is Freddy. Freddy's arm in Jason Goes and to laugh. Hell. Yeah, and laugh. Yeah. He did the laugh too when Freddy's pulling the thing down. You can tell it's not Robert's laugh. I thought that uh, the so. laugh was Adam Marcus. Oh, was it? Okay, I might be getting it mixed up. Yeah, Kane Hodder that, so. absolutely did the glove, yeah, but I yeah. think Adam Marcus did the laugh, and they just, uh, and don't quote me either, because I'm not sure, but I think I'm right. Uh, I think you might I have said that just, in the interview. Yeah, when we interview Adam Marcus, writer and director of Jason Goes to Hell, on this channel, go ahead and check it out in the archives. And also, since Josh brought up Slash Tracks and Nightmare on Elm Street 2010, the episode just went over 50,000 views. Josh, congratulations. You can check that out on this channel as well. Um no, and now as far as Freddy, since they since we're talking about him, we just talked about how they tried to replace him and stuff. Makeup for Freddy, ten out of ten. Witch yes. nose, witch nose, burnt skin. The glove looks phenomenal. The sweater looks burnt to shit. It looks dirty. The hat's dirty. His teeth are dirty. Ten out of ten. Best makeup probably in the franchise, in my opinion. Yeah, they knocked it out of the park, man. Yep. <laughs> out of there <laughs> it was yeah. good it's good it's, it's great it scared me like the whole the nose everything um i would say best freddy makeup of the series for me um there's another one i like that he doesn't like but we'll get to that uh when we get around to freddy's uh later in the franchise i don't want to give it away yet because a lot of people are probably going to have his reaction when i told him earlier uh, about another freddy makeup i like that apparently people don't like so um Freddy's lines, you got the body, I've got the, or, yeah, you've got the body, I've got the brain. Got the brain. Uh, we've right. got special work to do uh, here, me and you. Uh, save your, or help yourself, bitch, or save yourself, bitch, or save yourself, fucker. Doesn't he say that? Yeah. You're you all are, my children now. Yeah. Freddy's got, like, um, this is a really dark Freddy. There's not a lot of one-liners. As a matter of fact, I'd say there's almost no one-liners in this film. He's just dark and pissed. This is kind of how I like my Freddy. Um, yeah. He's an evil son of a bitch. He likes his work in this film. I would say the portrayal of Freddy, to me, 10 out of 10. I'd say the writing is what screwed him over later on with how they used him. Yeah. But Robert England's job as Freddy in this film, 10 out of 10. Probably one of the best Freddies ever. He went uh, all in, though. You know, I, I'll, I, nobody can ever say that he didn't commit to the role, no matter how it was written for him. Every mm -hmm. time he went to bat as Freddie, he he did his he did what the, he did it the best he could, even if it was 
too campy and shit, like in Freddy's Dead. Uh, or here, he was terrified. And he really got across to being pissed off and everything and angry, like you're saying. So, yeah. Who, um, so let's get into some characters other than Freddy. Uh, we've already discussed at length uh, Jesse and, and uh, Lisa and stuff, but let's just do a real quick uh, thing right here. Who is your favorite character other than Freddy, and who's your least favorite character in this film? Uh, favorite, character would be, favorite character would be Jesse. Uh, least favorite character other than Sharon, uh, since we didn't get to see her. Um, they never called the bitch. Um, <laughs> least favorite would be Grady. Um, okay. He, he never seemed to really, he wanted to like help his friend, but he, whenever the time came, it just seemed like Jesse was just an inconvenience, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He's like, dude. Sure, whatever. He's all, yeah, you can stay the night, but don't touch my Stray Cats poster in the back here, and I'm watching uh, Miss Nude USA on, on TV here. Don't Just leave me the hell alone, dude. <laughs> um, I would say my favorite character would be Lisa, uh, because not only is she pretty, and she's also charismatic, and the real lead of the film, she's also, dude, she's Nancy Light, man. She's actually trying to fight Freddy. She's trying to do something, Okay. Whether it she be got because really bad breath, really bad breath. Oh, dude, she's had to make out with Freddie, and she had Freddie's yeah. tongue in her mouth, and Freddie almost went down on her. Spoiler alert! And she makes out with Freddie at the end of the film too, bud. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, she probably had some pretty bad breath, but I would say Lisa's my favorite just because she tries to actually fix the solu- fix the problem, and um, she tries to. Be- she's a very good person. She's trying to help this guy that she likes, and here's another thing though about that character she just met jesse they're not like exclusive she's like in love with this guy she's like dedicated to this guy (laughs) and this guy has clearly got a lot of psychological issues she's into unattainable guys that's what it is she wants to fix him she's like she is going to fix jesse okay they haven't even went on a proper date yet there's no scene where they're when they're at the craven or anything they haven't even went on a date, man. <laughs> There's no scene where he asks her out. She, like, is in they're love the with this guy. Together. They're at the party together. Yeah. He's, and then he goes to stay the night with his best friend instead, but still. Yeah, and you know Jesse's got a huge boner because he just got done making out with uh, her, and the first place he wants to go to is go hang out with Grady. It's like, yeah. Dude. Yeah, there's some gay subtext for you right there, dude. Like, he's conflicted. He's like, I got this right here, and I got that right there. And he goes straight to Grady's house, and Grady's got his shirt off in bed there, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, even, even when he goes down, when he's, like, doing the stuff with, with her, I guess it can be said that if the, if the writer was really going for what he was going for, the, the subtext, you could argue that Freddy was, like, the real him inside of him that he was afraid the world would see as bad and evil and stuff. And it was like trying to get out, but he was fighting it. And he was, was like going suppressing out. it. Yeah. Suppressing it. Trying and whenever he's like out. making out when he's making out with his girlfriend and starts going down and you know, he's, it's like, he realizes it isn't me. It's not him. So he goes to see us, you know, go save the night with Brady. Uh, so, yeah. Like it's, it's a lot You're of that not, through the movie for sure. Dude. Yeah, no, you couldn't be more right, actually, if you look at it now. Um, He's making out with a female. uh, And then Freddy, the real him, homosexuality is trying to come up through his actual body and present itself to cock block the shit out of him. Out of her. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) I don't think so. Uh, Not today. (laughs) Yeah. No, no. Dikembe Mutombo. No, 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 no. Not today. Not today. Um, least favorite character for me, and this is how much I dislike her, and I've seen this movie a hundred times, Lisa's best friend throughout the film. I don't know what her name is in oh, the film. Shit. yeah. She yeah, is a shit. throwaway, nothing character. She, does, she brings nothing of substance to the film. She's just kind of like an 80s mall rat kind of... I forgot whatever. about her. She's annoying. She comes across as annoying to me throughout the film. She's just like, whatever. It's like, I don't even... They, she must have had a bigger part like pre-editing or something because she's she's clearly Lisa's best friend but we don't see a lot of her we only see her at the party when she's bitching about how hot the pool is 
and when Freddy's glove goes through her stomach in the bus at the end of the movie. Which was supposed to be the, uh, Lin- you say, what was her name, Linda? Lisa? Lisa. Yeah, Lisa was supposed to be the one that died. At the- I think they even filmed it. Uh, either her or Jesse, the claw comes through them at the end. But yeah. they went with the friend instead. You, you can find the scene online, I'm sure on YouTube, the deleted version. Uh, but I need to change my favorite uh, character before we move on. Jesse's my second favorite character, actually. Uh, I, had to, I really had to think hard about this, Alex. My favorite is the bus driver. <laughs> Get in the bus, bitch! <laughs> that scene where Freddy drives them into the desert and it all of a sudden is a thunderstorm... Um, that scene still holds up. That's scary. Yeah. That's a scary it's, image. It's freaky shit. Yeah. yeah. Not a big fan of that. Um, I was going to say, the reason they didn't kill Lisa, though, at the end of this film, is before Dream Warriors, um, there was actually, the part three was going to be Lisa's Revenge. <laughs> that was going to be the name of the film. Yeah, Lisa's oh, Revenge. Oh, okay. Because Freddy cock blocked her, uh, and Lisa was going to have okay. a revenge on Freddy. You know? okay. Being a teenager's tough when you're horny. Yeah, yeah. Not an easy yeah. deal, dude. I told you, hey, I told you on the podcast, I told you that story. If you guys have not seen the podcast story where I talk about getting my first kiss in the hallway and having to walk with a erection through the courtyard, te- being a teenager in, in puberty is not easy, okay? And if uh, I could have had my way... wasn't blowing hard. <laughs> it was a bad deal, dude. Walking across the whole courtyard trying to put my trapper keeper in front of my Johnson, that was not a good deal. And back in high school, I just wore sweats and shorts, so... Yeah, Le- Le- Freddy was having his revenge with a young Alex at that age back then. Um, let's get into special effects. Okay. Okay. The first few things that stand out for me, uh, Freddy, <laughs> Freddy coming out of Jesse's body yes. um, in Grady's room is one of the greatest scenes, not only in Elm Street history, but probably horror history. Um, phenomenal. Holds up to this day. Jesse's body falls off of Freddy like a meat suit. And yeah. J- Josh, I think we should show the clip. Yeah, let's do it because I want to say something on the back end. So. <laughs> I gotta say, it, it does look good. I'm not taking anything away from that. But when, when, like your first time seeing it, or if you're you're watching with other other people and everybody's getting into it, you don't really notice it. But there is like a moment in that scene where you can see how phony the body is, like the hands and everything. Um, mostly the hands give it away, you know, give away the effect. Uh, but yeah, it it still looks fucking brutal, man. And that's one of the main things I remember. That, the waterbed death later on, you know, in the other movies. Uh, the, the fucking Looney Tune thing where Freddy's moving the spikes and everything. There's like a handful of kills that everybody remembers. And I guarantee Jesse's is in everybody's top three or four uh, memorable moments from the series. Would you yeah. agree with that? Is this one of your most memorable ones? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. It's, it's, it's well done. It's, it's incredibly done. Um, I would also say Freddy, uh, Freddy's death at the end of the film is really great where he's basically melting. Uh, his skin is melting off and he's just kind of disintegrating yeah. like into nothingness. Like basically just, I, that's, that's a really good, uh, special effects work, practical, practical effects. They probably filmed that in reverse in hindsight. They probably, yeah. 
yeah, they probably melted him and then they reverse what, however they do that in Hollywood. I'm not like a special effects guy, but they do those things in reverse. I got a question hmm. before we uh, get done with the special effects here. Cause we're talking about like Jesse getting ripped apart, all that. Was this all psychological for Jesse and that's how he saw things happening? Or did Grady literally see Jesse get broke apart and Freddie come out and kill him? Or did he just say, see Jesse sitting there like, uh, 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 and then Jesse kills him, you know, mm-hmm. like, because we, we'll see it cuts away at one point and Jesse's got the blood and, and the glove and everything. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, uh, was he really turning into Freddie or was this Jesse the whole time? No, he was turning into Freddie because Grady reacts as if his friend's body just got ripped apart and Freddie is coming after him. Uh, I don't think he would have reacted in or such a like. I don't think he would have been like, Dad, Dad, open the door, Dad. Like, if it was just Jesse with a glove on, like, I don't, I don't see and him. And Freddie disappears. Like, Freddie disappears at one point, like, bloop, <laughs> just gone. Yeah, <laughs> I running. think, yeah. <laughs> I think Grady legitimately saw, which is also another problem with this film, because was Grady asleep yeah. then? That's yeah. a good point. And what happened to Jesse's shell of a body that's on the floor? You know, and then Freddy falls apart and Jesse's inside of him like, what? Yeah. Where's all these carcasses at? Are they still where Jesse left them or? I don't know. And I think New Line <laughs> Cinema, dude, I think New Line Cinema missed the boat on a mar- like a merchandising opportunity. They could have partnered with Transformers and they could have had <laughs> the Jesse Freddy Transformer. They blew it, man. They could have marketed that to children. <laughs> Jesse could have faked his death after all the events of this because they would have found his dead body in Grady's room if he, if Freddie really ripped out of him, right? Would, so. Hey, if Jesse and Freddie were a transformer and we were kids, would would he would he have been an Autobot or a Decepticon? <laughs> he would have been the Decepticon, but he would have been in the Optimus family. It would have been Optimus <laughs> bitch. So. Did you get the new Transformer, Optimus bitch? <laughs> um, I would say so. We've talked about the good, uh, the good special effects. The bad special effects is clearly the parakeet on the fishing line in the family's house flying around. Yes, yes, right. I agree completely. Yes. What about the towels whipping people? <laughs> oh yeah, the to- the towels. As a matter of fact, Josh, let's show the scene of the coach getting his ass whipped <laughs> to death. To death. <laughs> By Jesse Walsh in the shower after he's caught in the S&M club. Uh, let's do it. No! 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 pixelated for a second what the hell so yeah what do you think of the shower scene shower scene is uh one of my most confusing scenes and one of my favorite (laughs) scenes from this film because is and i've said it in slash tracks so if you've seen the slash tracks episode where we riff this film um is jesse the one whipping coach snyder (laughs) <laughs> or is the air whipping him to death? So I just or, thought it would be funny if they showed a towel in Jesse's hand and he's like, no! And he's got the towel. 
Does that uh, does that mean if it was if it was Freddie doing it though? If it was Freddie doing it, would there have been another carcass of Jesse at the school? <laughs> this man, hey, the, the the coroner shows up. He's like, this man, this man has third degree ass whipping burns on his cheeks. There's no his body could not process the amount of uh, titty twisters, purple nurples, and ass whips that he got from this young man. His body could not recover in time. He got so many noogie burns and uh, and what ass whips that and yeah, just couldn't process it. His body couldn't heal fast enough, and he's dead now. The coach, were- hey, the coach could have probably taken a lot more ass whippings than a normal person though at that night because he was so drunk. He couldn't yeah. really feel the pain. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, what what are your overall thoughts on the special effects? Are good or bad? What what's your what do you say? Um, there's some there's some pretty good stuff in the movie. Like uh, the tongue was pretty cool. Um, it didn't look too hokey. The Freddy coming out wasn't too bad. Um, the him fading into invisibility was weird. The the pull just turning on the jets, you know, just. To, uh, uh, show off the, that it's hot. You know, yeah. probably, if I if I rated it like out of ten, I would say it gets like a six only because of uh, when Freddy burst out of Jesse okay. and the ending. But the dog things, it would have got higher. But the dog baby face things, yeah. I'll put a picture on the screen. Those things take like three points off right there, man. Those fucking creepy ass dog things, yeah. baby face dogs. <laughs> they just ran out of ideas at that point. I think they're like, let's put some fucking weird baby faces on these dogs <laughs> for no reason. Oh, that was supposed to be Bob Shay's cameo, but he chose the bar scene instead. <laughs> I think an adult, I, th- <laughs> I think an adult Rottweiler suit probably would have cost more money than a few pieces of leather. Um, I was gonna say. The reason the pool got so hot was because all these teenagers are just horny as shit, you know, and they're in this pool and all their <laughs> loins, their loins are, they're Ugh. heating the pool up, Josh. It's bubbling okay. over with sexual energy. What do you think? Uh, yeah, and uh, is this the right time to talk about that scene or do I need to wait? Because um, I got something to talk about. It's one of my biggest complaints. <laughs> okay, well, okay, so we're going to go, we're done with special effects, and since you gave it a six, I'm going to say, I'm going to give it a seven, because I've given it a seven. One more every time, but go ahead. Well, you can, hey, but I give it a seven. It's definite, <laughs> definite crap in this film, but some definite good stuff. Um, and for the time, they did a good job with what they had. Let's get into the kills. Okay. All right. And let's keep this short and sweet, man. Uh, what is your, what is your, what is the kill that in your mind is the best and which one's the worst? Uh, the best kill, it's not what most, it's, it's, it's gotta be the coaches just because of the entertainment value alone. I'm sorry. (laughs) Just for the entertainment value. There's not a shit ton of kills here until the party, but the coach was fun. I remember, I remember the coach dying, you know, Jesse dying for the first time was fun, but you know, he said his body's not still there. So I don't, I don't guess that's a kill. Uh, the worst kill would probably be a lot of the people at the party because the party, you know, Freddie is in the real world and kills a few people when all they had to do was like 10 of them just tackle him and they could have ripped his arms off, ripped his head off. And Robert Robert England is like five, eight, five, nine, like 160 pounds. Um, So he's standing next to the, some of these teenagers that are like six, two, six, three, 200 pounds. Um, Help yourself, fucker. (laughs) <laughs> I guess he could have uh, and his child support has got to be high man there's like a hundred kids at that party you're all my children now Dude. so uh, he claimed them yeah, um, Lisa's family must what? have been rich Lisa's family <laughs> must have been rich to have to be able to feed that many fucking kids from Springwood at a party come on oh dude. god and the lights as soon as the lights go off in the parents bedroom they turn all the music on and shit like oh the lights went out my parents fall instantly to sleep that's how it's always been the dad and the dad's like oh they turn the light and then the mom's like oh let him have fun she's and so she's like basically gonna (laughs) blow him i guess like what 
Is that what she was going to do to calm him down? And that guy looks like... I guess so. <laughs> and he's like, well, I got to get some rest. And it's like, okay, well, bitch, like, maybe not let your daughter have a fucking 100-person pool party on a work night, you freaking dum-dum. This is your own fault. I just thought of something, Alex. I'm not wrong about them killing Freddy because he could have just turned into whatever he did when he walked through the fucking vines and the fence and turned into fire for a second or whatever. <laughs> what did you think of that? He disappears, but then also he like just merges through a fence and it's on fire. Like, what the fuck is Freddy in this movie? You know, is is he a dream demon? Is he a ghost? Is he is he just Jesse? And everybody else sees Jesse. I don't know. I have, uh, I have so an fucking... answer. I have an answer. I think I think Freddie is whatever that Jack Shoulder wanted him to be. How about that? <laughs> and he didn't make up his mind. Okay. Yeah, I think I think he was whatever the fuck uh, David Chaskin wanted to write him to be in this film, and that's my answer. I have a question for you, sir. Okay. Jesse is at the crime scene, okay, of all these murders. The coach, Grady, all the kids yep. at the pool party, uh, whatever. How bad are the CSI crime teams in Springwood? That Like, okay, I understand that, like, at the end of the film, uh, Lisa saves Jesse and Freddie's gone. And now Jesse's a free man. He's back on the school bus. Okay, well, if this is real life, they haven't collected any evidence at all. They haven't, I, they haven't interviewed any eyewitnesses. Jesse's going to fucking prison, Josh. He's not wow. going. I answered this earlier. You said that Freddie did for real come out of Jesse's body. Yeah, that, that, that wasn't was just Jesse. Okay, that body would still be ripped apart in Grady's room. So... All Jesse has to say is, I found out I had an evil twin. He killed everybody, and I fought and defended myself, and that's why he's de his dead body's in Grady's room. I was trying to save Grady, but it was too late. Well, so. okay. So by that logic, they're like, uh, Jesse, this isn't the first Jesse Walsh meat suit we found uh, in Springwood. <laughs> There's been like three or four of these. Do you have fucking four twins? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? Um, I was gonna say. Oh, so I haven't even done my kills. I would say my favorite <laughs> kill. Favorite kill is probably. I, uh, I would. I guess probably the pool scene where the kid says, "It's all right. Everything's all right. You're gonna be fine." And then Freddie's like, "You know, help yourself, fucker." That's probably my favorite, just for the line. And the kid, yeah. this amateur fucking Springwood psychologist kid, is like trying to reason with uh, Jesse Kruger here, uh, yeah. Freddie Walsh, uh, not having a great time. That's probably my favorite kill. And my least favorite kill is at the same party. It's him killing all the other kids who could have teamed up and beat the shit out of him. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like a little compliment sandwich there. You got the good, the bad, and the good, or the bad, good, bad at this pool party. You got a little bit of everything, man. That's why this movie is so universally uh, hated or loved. It's all over the place. Yeah, um, it is. Least favorite kill? Oh, favorite, my favorite kill was the, the kid. No, least favorite. Part. Least favorite. Oh, all the other kids being killed at the pool party. What about they, Jack Shoulder killing a sequel to the... To an awesome movie, does that one count? I think Jack Shoulder's work on Freddy's Revenge, uh, I think it comes across as a person who doesn't like the genre and doesn't <clears throat> didn't do his homework on the first film. Uh, he even says in interviews, uh, and he says it over and over again, that he felt no responsibility or want to continue what Wes Craven had done in the first film. And well, they call it revenge! <laughs> yeah, so by you doing that, you know, I I immediately am turned off by you. Uh, if you why, I mean, why direct something like this if you don't like the genre? Like, I understand you're a movie maker. You want to have your name on the map and what yada yada yada. But if you don't enjoy what you're doing in any aspect of life, it's going to show. I think you have to have a passion, and I think you have to have an understanding of what you're trying to create or make or talk about. People can see through that shit. 
Um, and I, I saw through it. You saw through it. The audience saw through it. Uh, fucking Rotten Tomatoes saw through it. Uh, everybody saw through it. Yeah, I, I, I think know. the movie. I think the movie should have been called, if this was going to be the sequel, "A Nightmare on Elm Street 2: Freddy Reborn." It would have been a perfect title. He even comes out of a body at one point. The revenge thing makes no sense uh, if you look at the way that you're saying the director handled the movie. Um, if he didn't want to honor the first movie, why the fuck? What's the re- That's what I want to ask. You know, the writer and uh, Bob Shea, whoever. You know, I'd like to know. Huh? No, I was just going to say, yeah, Bob oh. Shea, come on getting sidetracked <laughs> if you're watching this episode, please. No, I just want to know what the revenge is about. You know, what the fuck? That's the one thing. I, that's the one unanswered question that I really want answered from this movie. And I've got a few unanswered questions from this movie, but that one's at the top of my list. Do you, do you know uh, who what the this, fuck is getting revenge? Dude, I'll tell you who's getting revenge besides Lisa and number three. It should be called Jack Shoulders Revenge because he's getting revenge on the masterpiece that Wes Craven did. And he's getting revenge on the audience once again for giving the box office money to see this film when it was released in 1980, November 1st, 1985. Um, let's get into So we're going to we've already talked about the plot, but now we're just going to kind of like give our thoughts on the plot. Um, give me your favorite plot point and your least favorite plot point. And if you think the plot makes sense in general, go. No, the <clears throat> plot point, the plot does not make sense in general. There's too many unanswered questions. What happened to the Jesse meat suits? You know, whenever Freddie popped out, how did Freddie disappear? <laughs> Uh, is he dreaming? Is he awake? Uh, why the fuck is it called revenge? Um, I, I don't know what else to say that I haven't already said. Yeah. It's why just... does Freddie? Hey, why does Freddie want to possess Jesse? Why? Yeah. He doesn't really establish he's in the, that. He's in the house, sure, but I mean, there is a perfect victim for Freddie Krueger in this house. A adolescent girl. That is the ones he went after in life, but he goes after the seventeen-year-old guy. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's whatever. Well, the dream people, <laughs> the dream people from Freddy's Dead, uh, they switched up his job duties a little bit. So they didn't, they weren't sure what they wanted Freddy to do yet. So they were kind of tinkering with the job description. And this is just where they landed on. It, it's a think? creepy movie. The plot, I don't know what the plot really is. Uh, Love conquers homosexuality. I don't know. But... I don't know what they were going for exactly, but it, it... favorite you know, plot point, the, the <laughs> credits. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, I couldn't agree go. with you more. I, I don't like the plot. It's all over the place. I don't understand why Freddy wants to take Jesse's body over. And if he, and if I do look at it from the lens that, okay, Freddy wants to be in the real world again, to kill again. Okay. I can understand yeah. that. But the problem is, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the remake, everything else establishes that he is firmly entrenched in the dream world. Uh, and in yeah. Freddy's Dead, I know it's far later in the series, but like the dream demons did give him the job to do this. So he doesn't really have a choice in the matter. So, two, this makes no sense. So I don't understand it. The plot's all over the place. I know it's revisionist history by me say, like adding, you know, plot information from sequels down way down the road, but. It really doesn't make any sense. Um, it feels like a cash grab. I feel like they made this movie as fast as they possibly could because the first film was released in '84. They wanted it was New Line Cinema was a new company. They were trying to establish themselves. Uh, they were trying to turn a profit for the first time, um, and they wanted to get something out as quickly as possible. They tried to have Wes Craven come back. One of the points that Wes Craven said, like there was two things that Wes Craven basically turned this movie down. He said. I don't like the parakeet. I think that's ridiculous. That's that's something that he was quoted as saying. Wow. And the pool scene that we've talked about at length. Uh, he did. It just looks ridiculous. Freddy versus, you know, 50 teenagers. They could just beat the living piss out of him. It makes no sense. It's not scary. So those story points were given to him when they were trying to hire him to yes. write the movie? No, they wanted Wes to direct it. Wes did not oh. write it. They had okay. David Chaskin write it. Wes Craven wrote the original yeah, I thought I thought maybe they were trying to hire him to write and direct the second. No, one. no, gotcha. uh, 
Wes Craven never intended there to be a sequel to the first yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street. It that's ended why fine. The, I mean, it didn't end fine, but it was conclusive, you know? That's so. why the ending of the first Nightmare on Elm Street was so confusing, because it's like, okay, uh, Nancy turned her back on Freddy. Uh, Freddy's done. There is no sequel. It's over. She yeah. defeated Freddy. But, the you know, Bob Shea was like, hey, I want a sequel. Here you go. And then now we've got our sequel, and it's fucking even more confusing than the first one. But I love Freddy, so I'm fine with it. Would you tell somebody that's never seen the series before, save part two for when you're done with all the other ones, and watch one, then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? A hundred percent, I would say, if you've never watched the Nightmare on Elm Street films, watch the first one. Turn it off when she turns her back on Freddy, go to three, watch three, watch four, watch five, watch six, and then go back and watch seven, and then go back and watch two. Two is a standalone. I feel like two, Josh, I feel like number two could have been like a Freddy's Nightmares TV movie. Like, it could have been its own thing. Or like a like Freddy's... A or a Freddy... Freddy's Tales of Terror. It could have been its own story. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. You know, or a bizarro Freddy, like an yeah. alternate universe uh, Freddy or something. Exactly, yeah, definitely. exactly. Yeah. Like Spider-Man, where, spoiler alert, uh, the new Spider-Man, all three Spider-Men, the guys who have played him in the recent films, meet each other. You could have had Jackie Earl Haley standing next to Robert <laughs> England, standing next to Leather Pants Freddy from Wes Craven's New Nightmare, standing next to Jesse Krueger. All four of them. <laughs> How you doing, bitch? <laughs> How you doing, bitch? What's up, bitch? We've oh. got 15 more seconds to play. You, you forgot one thing. What? One Freddy. Sure. Superhero Freddy. <laughs> Super Freddy. <laughs> more powerful than a bastard maniac. <laughs> uh, yeah. Leap up. They can leap over... Short and tall bitches alike in a single bound. <laughs> Can leap over non-existent plot points in a single bound. Um, there you go. <laughs> okay, I'm going to So I said I don't like the plot. You don't like the plot. Uh, favorite, <laughs> favorite plot point. Hmm. I'm going to have to say when the director decided to end the film and roll the credits. That's what I said. So yeah. we agree. <laughs> yeah, we agree on that. And I'm going to have to say... Least favorite plot point. I don't even really need to say it again. I'm, we've already said it. It's just the movie makes yeah. no sense. And it didn't... It It's a standalone flick that I think... Had this film not been a Freddy film and they used any other monster as opposed to Freddy Krueger, I think the movie would have been better. I think if it was just a possession film with a boogeyman trying to possess Jesse, I think the movie would have made more sense. If they had even taken liberties to uh, actually work with uh, the Fresh Prince at the time and Jazzy Jeff and use their song, you know, like in the credits or, or a real music video, it might have made the movie even a little bit more uh, memorable and fun, you know? But, yeah. like, they were like, no, we're not going to have nothing to do with that. I like the song better than this movie, um, Will Smith's song. Nightmare, uh, Nightmare on My Street. Story. Yeah. Uh, so it was fat, not endorsed by the movie. So the fat the fat boys uh, fat boys had a Nightmare on Elm Street song for three. Was it for Dream War? Dream uh, no, Warriors? I think it was four. I think okay. three was uh, Dream Warriors. Getting ready uh, for Freddy was the Fat Boys. Um, mm -hmm. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I had the Pocket Rocker Fat Boys tape. You remember <laughs> Pocket Rockers? Oh man, I I don't. What they is were, that? tiny little tapes with one song on each side and a pocket rock. Oh. You had a little player, right? It had the Fat Boys and had the Bangles. Uh, <laughs> very big, big collection. Right, Josh. Um, now, My lights went out. Sorry. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Freddie was trying to possess your body during this review, dude. Um, I was going to say, so we're going to get into music really quick. This is going to be short and sweet because Josh and I are not music professionals. We're not musicians. We appreciate music because we are human beings, okay? Uh, I would say that uh, the only thing that really stands out is the end song. The B Bing Crosby of all people uh, sings "Have You Ever Seen a Dream Walking," and it's the ending credits song. There's nothing else that really stands out to me. Mm -hmm. 
I got nothing on music, Alex. I mean, what I said about Will Smith, I think if the studio had actually hired him uh, when they heard that song and, like, used it or something or, or whatever, instead of, uh, you know, getting on to him for it, threatening a lawsuit for the video. Yeah. I think that could have been fun. But I guess Freddie just wasn't to that point yet, like with the Fat Boys and everything. Uh, but, yeah, I got nothing on music. I'm sorry. It I, just, I don't remember anything. I think that's really interesting that New Line threatened a lawsuit on DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince for that Nightmare uh, on Elm Street song they did. Um, because Bob Shea says it himself in the Never Sleep Again documentary that, like, they just ripped off the Power Glove from Nintendo. And they're like, well, fuck it. We're just going to use it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like he yeah, wants to have his cake and eat it, too, I guess. Um, yeah. That's why I, the video, they had to, they, uh, Will Smith had made, it was going to make a video with like Freddie, like mm -hmm. Freddie makeup and everything. Uh, and when they found out they couldn't do it, they ended up making a music video that nobody saw until a few years ago. And it's like a Frankenstein Freddie. It's weird. It's like, it looks more like Frankenstein. It's Will Smith. Okay. Uh, check it out if you haven't seen it, people. It's on YouTube. I, it's pretty I, cool. I think the issue with Will Smith, though, wasn't like monetarily. I think it was... Freddie had said something about Will's wife, actually. Uh, Freddie had said something about Jada, Jada. And I apparently, this is all hearsay that I heard on set, you know. Apparently, <laughs> Freddie was doing kind of like stand-up, you know, on set. You know, kind of cutting a promo on Jada. Yeah. And yeah, Jada sure. was like, are you going to let Freddy Krueger talk to me like that, Will? And then Will said, get my wife's name out your fucking mouth, Freddie. And Freddie said, well, you know, she's a bitch. And uh, Will slapped the shit out of Freddie. Was it a bitch slap? It was a bitch slap, 100%. Okay. Which, is, <laughs> which is weird, because Freddie wasn't the one doing the bitch slap, and it was Will. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that we'll ever see Robert England and Will Smith ever uh, work together at the Oscars again after that one. What do you think? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think, yeah. I think Will and Freddie are done. Uh, working together now. Um, and, the, and the host, Josh, of the 2023 Oscars, Robert England in full Freddy Krueger makeup. <laughs> that gets some ratings, dude. I really think so. Uh, it would. I, honestly, yeah. I think people would tune into that. <laughs> Absolutely, dude. And he could be wearing the same suit he wore in Dream Warriors where he's asking for the goddamn bourbon. There you go. He's already got a suit. Um, Styling and profiling, bitch. Jada. Well, I said, where's the fucking bourbon, Jada? <laughs> uh, let's get into the good and the bad. So just two or three good things, two or three bad things, and then we'll get into the impact that this movie's had on uh, society, and then we'll grade it, and then we'll be done. The bad thing is we've almost talked longer about the movie than the movie actually is. <laughs> um, <laughs> the good is uh, Freddy's makeup. Robert England's performance. Yes. And the credits. Yeah. Uh, the bad is pretty much everything else. Actually, yeah. not the credits on the good stuff. I did enjoy Jesse. I thought Mark Patton did a great job as a final guy. Screen queen all the way. Awesome stuff. I know Alex isn't going to agree with me, but the bad stuff is pretty much all the unanswered questions. It's just, I got, yeah, that's, that's right. bad. Good. Freddy's makeup. Probably the best in the franchise. Good. Robert England, his whole portrayal as Freddy Krueger. Dark, scary, menacing. Bad. Jesse's dance in his bedroom. Kind of but scary. Also, <laughs> yeah, but also great. Jesse's dance in his bedroom. I agree. I agree. Uh, it's so bad, it's great. And also, I would say bad. Parakeet in the living room. Uh, why is the house so fucking hot constantly other than the fact that Freddy's in there? What's that all about? Because Freddy keeps stoking the fire all day. He's just down in the basement throwing baby yeah. dolls in there. Putting baby dolls in the fire. <laughs> um, well, he's trying to help the father out with the heating bill because he just yeah. bought a brand new house. So if he wants to keep the Walsh family in there to have enough time to possess the son, they can't move out. Sharon uh, is actually a furnace expert, but okay. they never called her. They should have called it. She's an ordained minister and a furnace expert now. Yep. Um, yeah, got some great points, got some bad points. Uh, what, do you, what do you think the movie, the impact on society, Josh? Anything? 
not at the time maybe, but now definitely, like with the Screen Queen documentary and everything. Yep, yep, definitely. Um, I think it showed that uh, anybody uh, can be a Screen Queen, you know. Um, it's not it's not a set type. I think uh, Mark Patton proved that. So He was yeah. the first male Scream Queen, so he broke the mold there. He's a trendsetter. I will give him that. Um, I will also say that the film is, to this day, one of the most popular homosexual-themed movies mm-hmm. in the genre Excuse of me. all time. Whether it meant to be or not, it is. And it will all, I think this movie will hold a place in history far longer than Freddy's Dead or Dream Child or some of the other films in the franchise. I think it definitely has stood the test of time. And if anything, the reviews are only getting better. Yeah, I can agree. Uh, Yeah, as society has changed, uh, the outlook on this film and the reviews on this film have changed. Uh, It used to be the black sheep. I mean, nobody liked this film for a long time. And if you talk to anybody nowadays, they'll say that they really like it. I mean, it's universally loved almost now. Total 180. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree completely. What would you give the movie on the finger glove scale? Yeah, so we're ending the episode. Uh, I oh, would I'm say, sorry. What else no, do we have? I'm Josh, <laughs> no, that's it. That is it. That was it. That's to- You're totally fine. Um, I would say finger glove scale. Um. I'll give it a two and a half, two and a half okay. finger finger blades out of what is it five or yeah out of four, five out of four. Okay, two and a half out of four. Okay, I give it two and three quarters. You bitch. It's just because I, you always go one more than me. You're uh, a bitch. No, I agree. I agree, and you know my reason for that. I think we've covered it so much throughout the whole episode. Uh, yeah, two and three quarters. It would be two and a half, but I got it go a little bit higher than him the extra quarter is for you mark so <laughs> um josh in the episode but before you do that dude uh give the patreon info and give the the business email oh yeah you've probably seen the patreon link and the email pop up throughout the episode it's that to contact us email about sponsorship just general questions to criticize us to belittle us uh to just bully us okay i think i'm gonna i'm giving you too many ideas it is slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com. And, and you can donate to our Patreon to help keep the channel going and growing. Uh, we can't monetize the channel because of too much like copyright content with the books and with the movies we've done. But you can support the channel for as low as a dollar a month. Uh, got some cool stuff coming up like Zoom calls with uh, patrons and stuff like that. So www.patreon.com forward slash 80 slasher librarian. The link should be on the screen. And Josh, one last thing. Brand new slash tracks action news coming at you next week. week. So it will be available next Saturday. So if you're seeing this episode this weekend, we're filming it. What is it today? Thursday, the 16th or 17th or whatever. Uh, You'll see that this weekend or you're watching it now. (laughs) <laughs> and then brand new podcast episode next weekend after that. So a lot of new stuff coming up. And then shortly after that, we're going to be riffing Final Destination 3. You guys picked that title. So that's going to be fun. Um, thank you all so much for watching. Be excellent to each other. Pleasant dreams. Uh, say good night, Alex. Good night, Alex. Mahalo, bitches. Bitches. No, okay, do it as Freddy. Mahalo, bitches. Mahalo, bitches. There you go.